Hi, everybody. This is Ernesto, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the promotional director for OC Camp. And I've got two people on the screen right now who are just incredible. I've got my boss, Ashley. She's the president <laughs> of OC Camp. <laughs> boss? <laughs> <laughs> Carla Rather. Carla, what's up? Hmm. Hey, I'm Carla, the president of OC Camp, um, and we want to tell you a little bit about Relationships 2018. Um, what that's about is bringing quality training experiences mm -hmm. to the Orange County mental health community. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to be doing on February 23rd is um, experiencing uh, time with Dr. Bob Weathers, and the way that this integrates into Relationships is about connection. So the way that we have connection is via vulnerability. And with that, I'd love to um, kind of let Bob share a little bit about what to expect on the 23rd. Uh, Welcome, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Ernesto. I'm very happy to be here. Very honored to, to be joining you on the 23rd of February. Uh, what I imagine, Carla, is um, a combination of things. I'm very used to teaching. I've taught my entire adult career in psychology, and I love teaching. I feel passionate about teaching. And so there'll be a teaching element to what we do for sure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, for uh, continuing education uh, requirements, there'll be, there'll be a curriculum uh, uh, that, that I'll be kind of weaving through the presentation. But what makes this presentation even more interesting to me, and I know that you and I have talked about this, is that we want to create uh, a dialogue. And the dialogue, as I was sharing earlier with Ernesto, the dialogue is edgy. It's risky because I, <laughs> I, the content is not only theoretical or clinical, but it's also very personal to me. And I can go into more of that with you uh, as we talk today. But the, the goal is to weave in, I think, uh, uh, really sound research-based uh, theory and clinical application, and that's very close and near to my heart across all these years, but also to bring in, uh, uh, in a way that's less typical in academics and, and even less typical in probably CE presentations, bring in a personal story that I hope will add, um, I think, add heft like add uh, depth and grounding mm -hmm. to what we're talking about. That's the part that feels risky to me because it's my wish is to be transparent. I don't have a lot of secrets around this, but it's very personal that what we'll be talking about too. It's not at arm's length. And so with your help, I'm hoping that we can kind of host a conversation that will touch people's hearts as well as their minds. That's really my wish. Yeah, you know, one thing that I notice about um, the, the mental health profession is that, and part of the OC camp direction is this idea of you don't th there's a shame based approach to the things that we do and you know we want to w with your help um, um, we want to expose that idea because I, you've been through a journey right you've been through such a powerful testimony for the mental health profession mm, thank you ernesto um, i'm happy to to dive in more with that carla what would you like me to do next <laughs> Uh, well, um, we know that silence tends to perpetuate shame mm -hmm. and disconnection. And I love what you're saying about a blend of didactic learning as well as an experiential element um, to, to what we're going to be doing on the 23rd. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could sort of speak from your perspective a little bit about how truly this is vulnerable to be able to speak openly about something that, that yeah. touches your life. Yeah, you know, something that Ernesto and I were talking about just before we started is that uh, I've had friends of mine that aren't in psychology, and I have plenty of friends, most of my friends are in psychology and the mental health disciplines, but uh, friends who have commented on the irony that in mental health writ large, mm. therapists, psychologists, marriage and family therapists, and so on, that there tend to be... Um, that's it. There tends to be more of this kind of shroud of silence or secrecy, mm -hmm. uh, and I have very firsthand, uh, uh, firsthand acquaintanceship with that for sure. But that uh, people will comment. The, the ironic part is that, as as you and I were talking, Ernesto, uh, most other professional disciplines, whether it's medicine or nursing or law, uh, dentistry, uh, the military have much more active kind of advocacy of people that get into tr trouble with addiction. And that's really my story. Uh, Mid-career for me, uh, I got into a great deal of trouble with alcohol and drug addiction. And uh, uh, 
that there didn't feel like there were any self safe outlets for the uh, for what am I going to do about this? I don't blame anybody, and you're not talking about this, Ernesto. I have no one to blame for this. I take full responsibility. But the the there was a compounding of my situation, and then I've now found uh, in the years uh, since then that a number of people have reached out to me in the professions. I've, I've, uh, dozens of people have reached out to me from different professions saying, how did you make it through this? And particularly people in the mental health saying, what am I going to do about this? The, the, the catch 22 is this, you guys, is that we're in a profession that addresses addiction um, uh, uh, all the time. In fact, recent research with Sa uh, SAMHSA suggested that up to 50% of our adult clients are coming in with active clinically di uh, diagnosable addiction. That seems very high, but, but if you've been active clinically for a while, you probably resonate with that. So it's, we deal with, the point is, is that we deal with it. It's commonplace to deal with it. But when it happens within our own professions, we, we kind, of, uh, uh, kind of don't know what to do about that. And I feel deeply committed to this profession. I'm no longer licensed as a psychologist. But I feel deeply committed and am working as a recovery coach, working in ancillary disciplines all the time. I feel deeply committed to helping bring this out of the shadows if possible. And if my story can help instruct or illuminate and also warn, caution, others, uh, mm -hmm. then I'm very willing to bring it. Uh, it's not fun for me because the story is not fun. But I'm really committed to the long picture with our discipline here. And I think it's in a process of evolution. I think you guys inviting me. Carla Ernesto to this presentation speaks volumes because I certainly have been been I, I've had people reach out to me across the country and when I didn't get relicensed I there's a 10-year period and I went for relicensure and I was not relicensed all of those phone calls stopped it was Aww. like everything was contingent on Bob's gonna get relicensed I assumed that I would I didn't and for for whatever reasons but uh, you guys I really I, I, t I take this as sacred charge to be with you I'm really grateful to be with you and so let's see what we can create together. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Bob, I just want to communicate. I, I deeply respect you and mm -hmm. I deeply respect and see the process that you have mm -hmm. gone through to make mm -hmm. sense of your experience. Mm -hmm. I know that you also carry a very uh, positive reputation in the field and that many others see the same that I do. Mm -hmm. And thank you. What I really wanted, you know, despite it being edgy or evocative, whatever you want to call it, really want to normalize that we as human beings, we make mistakes sometimes. Yep. And when we do, the real horror is if it feels like there's no way to redeem those, no way to work through, no way to, in essence, ultimately establish repair. Right. Um, well, and so. I really want to say in, in situations in my own personal life where I have felt hurt or wrong, it's that uh, unaddressing of that remains and sticks. And what I've seen you doing is perpetually trying to repair where there has been rupture. Mm -hmm. And I, I deeply respect that. And clinicians from pre-licensed to seasoned folks have a lot to learn from you mm -hmm. in humility. Yeah. Um, uh, it feels really good for you to say all of that. I really take it in humbly and really gratefully. Thank you, Carla. It's very touching to me. Um, one of the things that came up to me as I was listening to you, and it's true about me, uh, uh, is I always envied friends of mine. All of my friends were psychologists. <laughs> it's just it's who, who I hung out with. <laughs> psychologists and drummers. I'm a musician. You know that. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, I always envied my friends who seem so much com more comfortable disclosing their vulnerabilities or their shadow than me. And that's the honest to goodness truth. I just feel like if anybody could have been signed up for what I've been doing in the last 10 years, which is what you're talking about, I would be the last person. It reminds me of biblical stories like of Moses or Jeremiah. They're going, hmm. no, Lord, please keep yes. that away from me. <laughs> Not I, me. I stutter. Please don't make me do this. And, and so when it comes to addressing shame and stigma, which has been the focus of my work for the last uh, decade, uh, to begin with, uh, quite honestly, it was just completely personal. I needed to address this or I was going to die. I felt like I was just mm -hmm. like, put it on myself. And I can talk more about that with you guys today or another time. But you know, one, one, one yeah. of the things, Bob, that that's coming up for me is, mm -hmm. you know, when you talked about some of the biblical characters, yeah. it made them very powerful when they got mm -hmm. to that point of yeah. their humanness and that they can't yeah. do everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. I, for me personally, I love reaching out to individuals who are human. 
mm-hmm. who's made it and then they're still smiling look at your smile i mean it's like yes it's almost as if you've lost everything but it's like you know what i'm still going to help people whereas some people who um don't see any hope they see so much of their identity with the phd the psyd the <laughs> mfts and they make that their identity but for you it seems like from what your the energy that i'm getting from you your identity is rooted somewhere else and that's why you're not breaking mm-hmm. <laughs> i have a very dear friend of mine i met jim in graduate school i went to fuller school of psychology 40 years ago and i met jim there jim finley and jim had spent the 60s he was uh, at a, at, at a an abbey in Kentucky his his uh, spiritual director was Thomas Merton and and Jim told me that Thomas Merton used to say to him that sometimes life reduces you down to a nub and then something comes along and erases that nub oh, <laughs> <laughs> can you see why i remember and, that right and you <laughs> you were the nub that got erased it's like you lost everything you suffered but you have joy you found and a way to have joy in the midst there's no way for me to talk about this without talking about it in terms of grace and whatever whatever spiritual tradition one comes from or not there's just been an experience of incredible grace it's been it's been mediated by people like you carla who love me love me through my <laughs> wife colleen and so on and i take all of that in I, i i've shared this image i feel like a whale that eats plankton i just survive off of grace and, oh. and always take it in. So, <laughs> and i maybe i need a lot more than most people but i i flourish in the presence of of graceful plankton and so uh i feel i feel completely <laughs> graced that's the truth and so the smile that you see uh, ernesto or the hope that you that you can feel coming from me is completely supplied uh, uh by virtue of grace I, i i really stand by that and and that grace has been mediated by good therapists by good supervisors I can call all of them out that have continued to be with me been formative through this process. There's been a lot of saving grace that's been mediated through our profession and then through personal friends and a lot of prayer, <laughs> a lot of prayer. So all of the above for sure. And so I don't assume that there's any kind of a uh, formulaic approach to this for anybody i have great compassion for those that have been taken out by this because there's a good portion of people that go through this and are just flat out wiped out permanently by it. and i don't i so i don't have any kind of holier than thou this is complete grace it's what keeps me in humility mm-hmm. in, in all of this it also keeps me in hope because when i was at the very bottom to begin to feel oxygen coming in primarily for me through my deepest connections my daughter my wife my closest friends um if if it weren't for that there would be no hope and i've experienced it i'll tell you this you know you read about this in the new testament or whatever tradition somebody comes from but when you read about that there's nothing that can come that can kick you so far off the planet that you won't find recovery mm-hmm. i've had that experience it really gives me a kind of confidence it's not arrogance because i really believe that a hurricane could hit tomorrow i know what that's like i had one supervisor say to me dear dear supervisor say Bob, I've heard of lightning hitting hitting somebody once in their life. I've never known anybody who got hit twice, and I got hit really twice. And the worst of it is of my own devising with quotes mm-hmm. around that because of all the all that led to that. But nevertheless, I made decisions that led to lightning hitting twice and that if 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 the universe or god or however you understand that can supply grace amidst that then it can work for anybody and so i have utter faith utter confidence in that and that's what leads me to smile that's what leads me to care about what we're talking about i want to help others uh find their own ways to grace you know carla just just hearing um bob right now and this is bob this is the first time i've heard of you i mean this is literally i mean i just see you i i can already tell that um you're going to really really help the mental health community to see this mm. and to hear about your story it's such a powerful story and then to interweave your mm. with grace and your family and how you stayed with it i mean this is the kind of stuff that we need to hear right thank you thank you for saying that you know when you say that what comes up for me is the darkness of my story and i don't want to pretend like that's not there it it is compensated by by all that we're talking about in terms of light and and loving kindness and hope but it's such a dark story and i and i'm well aware that for some people it can be traumatizing 
uh, to, to hear the story. I have friends of mine in the profession, and I won't name these, but these are people that said if they'd gone through what I'd gone through, they would have just killed themselves. Mm-hmm. And these are people in my mm-hmm. profession that were friends. It just it, it brings up traumatic material for people, and I, I don't take that lightly at all, including for this presentation. I'm really mindful mm-hmm. that this can land for some people in a way that it just goes into – you know, they've been wounded themselves or they've experienced some version of this themselves. I want to be as careful as I can. I don't want to put my light under a bushel basket, but I'm also concerned about how this can be received. Well, this is great, Bob, because what we're going to be doing is modeling that when we go into the dark, which yeah. inevitably happens for yeah. us at some point, yeah. we can come back out right. into the light mm-hmm. and that part of sharing the experience helps lighten the shame, the stigma, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. until we can be community and humanity together again, mm-hmm. having made sense of our experiences and acknowledging our part in that mm-hmm. and being able to return to connection. Mm-hmm. Thank That's, you. Thank we're going to be modeling that. Yeah. Thank and you and I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful to you, Bob, for being yeah. willing to be open and vulnerable and authentic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that so much. I'll tell you one thing, uh, and it's implied, I'm sure, in both of you guys have experienced this. I'll ask, I lead uh, uh, two groups each week at a local treatment center with men who are in recovery from serious addiction, heroin and methamphetamine typically. And they'll oftentimes say, Dr. Bob, your group is the only group that we really like. I shouldn't really tell those slides, <laughs> okay? But they'll, they'll say this. And because I'm curious, I'm always interested. It, it doesn't have to be just self-congratulatory. I'll say, what is it, you guys? And they'll say some version of what we're talking about right now. They, they say, you share your story. You're a psychologist that lost everything. You share your story, and in sharing it, you give us hope. And so they feel the, the, I think they feel the realness of it because I understand in so many ways what they're going through, but also that it's not the end of the road. And something about that, I never knew that before because I never had experienced it before. Now, I wouldn't wish this on my worst (laughs) enemy. Don't get me wrong about this. But if life hands you this, then what do you do with it? And with grace, what you can do with it is miraculous. I am Mm -hmm. so gratified. I'll tell you this, Carla and Ernesto. Ah, I have the chills even saying this. I would (laughs) not want to go back to where I was before this by virtue of what's been gained. All that I've been through is horribly painful, and I'm especially painful. When I met with the board a little over, it's actually coming up on two years ago, they asked me, Mm. there was a question they asked me in terms of regrets, and I remember telling them, and I feel it right now, my regrets are for people that entrusted me that may have, that may have been tarnished by what I've been through. It kills me, Mm. former students, with former clients, with anybody that's known me. Because for the most part, by far and away the most part, I feel like that I've been a person that was worthy of their trust. And I, in, in, in losing that by virtue of my behaviors and my loss of, of all that I've lost, it just kills me because I, uh, I wouldn't want to have done that. So I take really seriously, what can I do to, to uh, rebuild that? And, and, so, and so in this, what's amazing to me is ever have ever, after having lost everything, is that there's ability to come back and give to people and have them, again, entrust me. I have it on my website. I have a brand new website, and I can't remember the wording right now, but I worked on this, is that I, I share openly on the website what I've been through. I call it Living Amends is, is the essay on my <laughs> website. And, and on my website, it makes some point that, that for people that work with me in recovery coaching, I can guarantee you that I've learned some really important lessons along the way that actually do make me trustworthy in a way that you could hardly imagine. <laughs> it's like something has really been refined in the fire of all this happened. And I do feel the truth of that. It's contingent on a number of things. It's contingent on sustained humility. It's contingent for sure on a commitment to sobriety, in my case. And it's a commitment to doing the work that's, that my addictions got in the way of. They actually were a, an, attempt to, a, an attempted antidote is that I needed to do even deeper level work than I had done. I'd done a lot of work, mm. even deeper level work, and I'm committed to that for a lifetime. And so I think that does communicate when I'm working with clients, and I'm grateful for that. Bob, all I'm thinking about is where's your book? <laughs> it's coming out right yeah, yeah yeah i'll tell you the truth you guys i just i just finished my book it's it's the title of it is unshaming and it's it's looking oh. at self-forgiveness as daily practice and so oh. right into what we're talking about and it's all that i've been about for my own purposes and then in the teaching that i do now for the last 10 years now here's the last piece you guys this is what's holding it up is that 
in light of what's happened in the last six months to a year, particularly in the Me Too movement, which I feel so yes. supportive of, I feel like it's, it's incumbent upon me to weave into my story because I'm one of those that could be indicted and has been indicted. I'm one of those mm -hmm. as well. And uh, that's part of my story is having crossed boundaries. It's very painful to me to, to uh, confess it even here is that it won't do for me not to weave this in to bring it to the next level of currency. So I'm, I'm doing that right now. So the book is written. It's a matter now of weaving in these threads because I, I feel like there's, there's a point. In, I'll tell you, my work is with men who have fouled up. There's not a man that I work with in recovery who hasn't violated relationships that were important to them. And I, I honestly, I'll ask in the room, there'll be no one that doesn't raise their hand. And so, and, and I'm one of those men. And so my work is helping to help men heal what they've done, both in terms of making amends, as well as self-forgiveness and changing their lives. That's all the work I do. And I feel like that when that's ready in, in, in the current kind of climate, when that's ready, what do we men need to do to learn how to honor the women in our lives so that we don't continue to violate again and again? How do we create another generation of men that are actually on the way to healing? I'm really committed to that. So I'm wanting to bring in that at least as part of this book. So that's where the book is right now. Awesome. awesome. Wow. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting emotional right now just hearing some of the things that are interweaved into your experience, Bob. And how you're responding to that with um, mm. an open heart and it's a, it's a part of the story and you're, mm. you're so uh, just authentic. So thank you. Really looking forward to hearing more. So let, let's close off um, our interview. And for those of you who are watching this video, we really want you guys to come and be a part of the OC count uh, membership and uh, the events that we have, especially uh, hear Bob and his testimony and his road to recovery and sobriety. And I think this is a very powerful approach to really, uh, if you're struggling with shame, embarrassment, and you're putting a lot of weight on your, uh, on your identity as a clinician, this may be an antidote to that, that there's much bigger things in life than what you put all your hopes and dreams in one basket, right? Carla, any other uh, 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 parting remarks? Repair is possible. I'm just so excited about that. <laughs> thank you, Ernesto, and thank you, Bob. Looking forward to it very much. Thank both of you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, we're going to close this off and I want you guys to click on the link to register for this or um, let us know whoever you want us to um, uh, for the presentations and events. Uh, again, you are going to find an empowering, empowering speaker in February lunch. And thank you again so much. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Bye-bye. Giddy up. <laughs>